Hello, everyone. Welcome to the GSA webinar, Aging Policy and the 2020 Election Results. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the GSA website. A notice to all attendees will be distributed once the recording is available. A question and answer session will immediately follow the live presentations. Throughout the program, we will be accepting questions through the questions feature accessible on the GoToWebinar panel. So without further delay, I'll hand the microphone to Brian Lindbergh, GSA's Policy Advisor. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Judy. Uh, my name is Brian Lindbergh, and um, as Judy said, I'm GSA's Public Policy Advisor here in Washington, D.C. And I work very closely with Trish D'Antonio, who is on the line with us and helping today, um, who is GSA's Vice President for Professional Affairs. So welcome to today's webinar, Aging Policy and the 2020 Election Results. Um, as I recall, the last time we did this session was at the annual meeting in New Orleans. Uh, Trump had just been elected. We had a very large room which was packed and we had folks lined up in the hall in the hotel telling us that we we're gonna go over the fire restrictions. Um, so I like a good crowd, but that crowd um, that year was in disbelief and shock actually. Um, and I, should, I would uh, be remiss really if I didn't mention that our dear friend uh, Greg O'Neill was there with us and we've lost him since that time. Um, this year, we're, um, I guess you'd say, seasoned to disbelief and shock. In fact, few things shock us any longer, given the last four years and the last eight months of the pandemic. So let me introduce um, our not-so-shocking panel. You'll see in a second why. Um, we have three well-respected aging and healthcare thought leaders, but only one has that in his title. Gene Axios is Senior Vice President for AARP Global Thought Leadership. And Gene is an amazing colleague to have with his knowledge in a range of aging issues, including long-term care, which we hope we hear a little bit about today, his commitment to working collaboratively with others to find solutions to our biggest challenges, and his ability to integrate so much he's learned from around the world into his work. Gene has also been working for longer than most on bringing real change to the way our society has often ignored health equity issues and systemic racism. We had to book our very popular second speaker just after that panel I mentioned in New Orleans four years ago. Bob Blancato is an essential part of any discussion like this in, in part because his experiences blends so perfectly policy, politics, and the process. Um, those are things I always try and bring out in my GSA newsletter columns. He has used that deep understanding to serve members of Congress and his clients to advocate and lobby for them. Um, he has, for example, um, been the leading force behind the elder justice movement as the national coordinator for the Elder Justice Coalition and has helped to ensure that millions of older adults have access to nutritious meals each day through his leadership with the Defeat Mount Nutrition Today Coalition and the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Services Programs, where he's the executive director. And hopefully, many of you know our third speaker, Grace Whiting. She is a force in the aging advocacy world that is and will be heard from for a long time ahead. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one should avoid ageist stereotypes, but frankly, Grace and Jean, for that matter, are the next generation of leaders that give me faith will be able to tackle the needs of the aging population. Grace is the CEO of the National Alliance for Caregiving, and through her work, has made an enormous contribution to the issue by providing policymakers with both evidence-based studies and real stories that paint a picture of the struggles of paid and family caregivers. So, what a wild week, what a wild campaign and election it's been. Hopefully not the new normal, except so many of us voted, um, even in the face of the pandemic, that would be a great new normal. 
it's difficult to frame this session without undercutting my speakers. So let me mention just a couple issues that stand out for me as factors. Um, my theory has been for a couple years now that independents would not vote twice for Donald Trump. They made a statement about the system and they wanted to give an outsider a chance, but they wouldn't be pleased with the partisanship, the chaotic nature of the way Trump governed. And to some extent, his steady attack on President Obama didn't do him well because I think some of those voters voted for Obama as well. I think that made a difference. Based on the exit polling I've seen, Republicans voted for Trump 93% of the time this year. Democrats voted for Biden 94% of the time, but independents voted for Biden 54 to 40%. That's, that's a 14 point difference. In 2016, they voted for Trump over Clinton 46 to 42. So that's, that is a very big swing. A related factor was that this was pretty much a head-to-head -head contest. If you recall, in 2016, third-party candidates um, had a role, and they received more than 6 million votes that year. Let me close with something that um, has already become a pet peeve of mine, as I've been watching hundreds of hours of CNN and MSNBC with some Fox mixed in for good measure. Uh, we have heard how close the vote is and how difficult it's going to be for Vice President or President-elect Biden to get anything done. But this isn't anything new. This is the second time in a little more than four years that the majority of voters said they didn't want Donald Trump to be president, this time by more than four million votes. Trump didn't have a majority and he didn't even try to bridge the divide. And he did get some of his agenda done. If you recall, George W. Bush lost the popular vote to Gore by 500,000 votes and barely won the Electoral College 271 to 268, 266. And when he beat Kerry four years later, he won by 3 million votes, and it was also a close Electoral College vote. Bill Clinton, who handily won the Electoral College, actually had less votes than Bush and Perot combined. So my point is simply this. We are pretty evenly divided in, the, in this country. And Joe Biden has as good a shot, maybe better, of bridging the divide as many others who have walked into the White House on January 20th. The divide within his own party may be equally challenging for him. So here we go. We'd like to um, have today's webinar be conversational. So I'll begin with a round of questions. And it is our hope that you will write questions into the chat and Trish and I will help field them and get them to the uh, speakers. So let me start with you, Gene. First question: With such a close vote, with such close vote counts in a number of states, tell us your thoughts on the role of the older voter and minority voters in President-elect Biden's electoral and popular vote victories. Well, first of all, Brian, I would like to start off by thanking you uh, for the opportunity to be a uh, part of this distinguished panel. Uh, I am a big fan of Bob, as he knows, and also of Gray. So I'm really humbled to be part of this conversation today. I think as part of your opening, you you said something that I want to kind of pick up on, and is this whole notion of, 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 of division, and that we've pretty much been a divided country for uh, quite some time. Uh, I think there's some key takeaways from the election that I would just like to briefly share. Uh, the first one is what you alluded to in terms of the historic voter participation that we've seen. Uh, despite the pandemic, despite the tremendous amount of crisis that we've experienced over the last uh, eight months or so, one of the things that we uh, saw, particularly with regards to the election, was record voter turnout. Uh, as you indicated, Vice uh, President-elect Biden received uh, more than 70 million votes which is the most uh, votes uh, in US history. And I also should note that a second to that was President Trump who received nearly 70 million. Uh, so in addition to the historic voter participation, uh, the second uh, key takeaway is what you articulated with um, the continual uh, political po polarization that's likely to continue. I think it's fair to say when you look at the 2020 election relative to the 2016 election, particularly among older adults, that this election was actually more competitive. 
uh, many of the exit polling that I'm seeing uh, suggests that in 2016, uh, President Trump uh, won the older voter uh, group by roughly around maybe eight percentage points. Whereas in this cycle, we've seen a difference of maybe one percentage to three percentage points. Uh, so I do want to kind of note that, uh, that Biden, President-elect Biden did make some inroads among the older adult population, which made it more competitive, uh, this go around. Uh, in addition to uh, some of the trends, uh, another thing I would just mention is the fact that we did see an increase in older voters uh, in general. We know that older voters vote, uh, they vote in, in bloc, uh, and we also saw a significant increase uh, in the number of voters over the age of 65 uh, from 2016 um, to 2020. And then I would just really just want to kind of talk about, if I have a few more minutes, just looking at some of the, the gender uh, and, and age categories uh, as well. Uh, we saw a very large gender gap among older voters. Uh, when I look at some of the exit polling, it's remarkable to see that uh, in 2016, uh, particularly around, uh, with regards to men, uh, tr Trump won significantly, whereas this go around in 2020 was very competitive. And then with regards to gender, we saw a significant gap uh, as well, uh, with women uh, overwhelmingly supporting um, uh, President Biden, uh, President-elect Biden by five percentage points. Um, and then finally, when you look at a race, uh, I know this has been a topic, uh, particularly um, over the last couple of days. Um, one thing to note is the fact that uh, African Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, um, is not a monolithic group, uh, but we did see that uh, significant uh, support uh, among those populations for Biden. Interestingly enough, I know that this has been talked about uh, quite a bit when you look at the support uh, for President Biden relative to um, uh, Clinton in 2016. Uh, we saw um, a decline in some cases, but nevertheless, those groups overwhelmingly supported uh, President-elect Biden. Thank you, Gene. Um... Bob, let me um, let me turn to you. Um, uh, the, you know, every, all the announcers are talking about President-elect Biden um, taking back the blue wall, as they call it. Um, but this election would not be called a blue wave. Uh, what are your thoughts on what happened in the House and the Senate and how this will affect the new administration's ability to move its agenda forward? Well, first of all, thank you, Brian, and uh, for a too generous introduction, I think, of all of us. Uh, let's give you a little shout out for the great work you're doing for GSA, enhancing its policy work, uh, making a difference in many places, and uh, convening this panel. Trish, thank you also for inviting us to be part of this and the great work you're doing. So it may not have been the true blue wave, but at least we get to wave goodbye. Um, and of course, with the two special elections that are happening in Georgia, possibly resulting in a Democrat uh, getting the Senate, we can assess things better in January on, your, on the complete picture and question that you asked. But first thing we have to do is consider the two things that are gonna happen before January 20. The president conceding and a lame duck session of Congress. On the first, we really are just gonna have to wait. On the second, it actually begins today. And what has not changed as a result of the election is the pandemic. In fact, it's gotten worse in a wider area of our nation. That makes it still the number one issue before the lame duck session and passing a fourth COVID emergency package bill remains critically important. It's been since late March since the last bill was passed. You know, the House did its part and passed a hero's bill on October 1st, but the Senate failed to act. You know, the pandemic is a health care and an economic crisis. We all know this. Uh, Majority Leader McConnell provided some degree of hope when he said we needed to get one done before the end of the year but their differences are there in terms of the amount and the specifics. Two approaches might be tried. There might be a smaller targeted COVID bill uh, to, to the programs most in need now, and then a much bigger bill that President-elect Biden can be the, be the first bill he gets to sign. Also, it has to get done, as you know, in the lame duck is extending the, the continuing resolution. And again, majority leader said, it's, let's do an omnibus, not just another extension. Um, yes, and there will be changes. But you know, looking at the other part of your question, it's possible that both Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader McConnell will, will continue, what's likely they will continue to lead, but with somewhat less power because of the election. The pandemic will continue to be the key issue when Biden takes over, 
but the approach will be different. We will not. We will accept and not deny the reality of COVID-19. Science will resume its rightful place in the quest to control the pandemic. And all you have to do is look at the decision today, announcement today by the Vice President Biden about his COVID task force. And by, as you pointed out, Brian, Biden's reputation of working across the aisle may be vital here. Some very important Republicans are still in office that work with him when he was in the Senate. It really is going to depend on the majority leader to some extent. How big is the margin he gets to work with in the Senate? The Senate, ha the Senate Republicans have a hugely tough map in 2022 for the next the next election. And we hope Vice President Biden gets a limited honeymoon. But I hope again, it's driven by the pandemic in the sense that we have a national crisis that's searching for bipartisan solutions. And how the lame duck session ends up may have a big bearing on the first days of the Biden administration. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, Grace, you're up. Um, so I was doing a little digging and I found a tweet from 2019 of um, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. And she said, of the 40 million family caregivers in the US, one in four are millennials, guaranteed paid family leave would support families, protect workers, assist those taking on the role as caregiver and give financial security for future generations. It sounds like something you might be saying. So what are your thoughts and emotions regarding her election and also whether the new administration will tackle some of these issues on your caregiver agenda? Brian, thank you so much for the question. And let me just say, I am just thrilled to be spending my lunch hour with such wonderful colleagues um, and, and for all the work that all of you are doing and aging and caregiving and really lifting up the voice of people who need it um, in Congress and with other policymakers. You know, I would say I'm feeling cautious optimism. Um, and the funny thing about caregiving is caregiving really is as American as apple pie in the sense that you have people from all different backgrounds supporting it. So the two most recent pieces of caregiving legislation, the Raise Family Caregivers Act and the expansion of the VA Mention Act, which uh, expands the VA Caregiver Support Program, those both happen under President Trump. Um, likewise, you can think back to the Lifespan Respite bill, which, you know, was really championed by then Senator Hillary Clinton. And so, you know, there's a lot, I think, of opportunity here in that Biden as a coalition builder has a personal interest in caregiving. His wife worked very closely on the Hidden Heroes work. And then I think Kamala brings a perspective that's unique, that's you know, recognizes that American families are not one size fits all. Um, and I think the paid leave piece is a big part of that. I mean, we know from our research with AARP that we are seeing more employers offer paid leave as compared to five years ago, 39% versus 32. We know more employers are offering paid sick leave, 58% versus 52% when we looked at this back in 2015. But the reality is, is that most people still do not have paid leave. Um, now, it's possible that COVID is going to change that. But when we think about younger people in the workforce, you know, younger folks are less likely to have the same types of protection. So they tend not to be salaried or if they are salaried, not very senior. They tend to have less in the way of benefits in terms of paid time off and uh, sick leave and vacation and all of that. So I, I'm optimistic in that I think um, people are much more open, if particularly younger workers, about caring for others in their family. But I also think there's still a long way to go. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, it is a bipartisan issue, and we and we can really be hopeful that uh, this might make the difference. But as Bob points out, the the Senate, uh, <laughs> the the the, the long-term successes of a lot of policies may may have to do with the final Senate makeup. Gene, I'm going to jump back to you and and revisit an issue that I mentioned in your intro. Um, and I know you're you're one of the more optimistic uh, colleagues I have. Um, I'm curious whether you believe 
the new focus on health equity and disparities, um, the realities of social determinants of health that people have seen, you know, as a result of the pandemic and the issues around racial justice um, that uh, so many people um, demonstrated about um, this, this year. I'm wondering what you're thinking in terms of how that will influence the coming agenda in Congress, the new administration, um, and, and you know, anything you'd like to talk about the work you're doing in that space. Sure, sure. Uh, well, thanks, thanks again, uh, Brian. I, I am uh, one, uh, like Grace indicated, as cautiously optimistic uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I do think that uh, over the course of the last several months, uh, we've really seen uh, in very stark terms the inequities that are in our systems, uh, whether that is in the context of long-term care or the context of health uh, care more broadly, uh, the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans is extremely high uh, relative to the general population. Uh, and I've mentioned this in the past, and I think we can all agree that uh, COVID-19 did not uh, create these disparities. They've actually are, have been long-standing issues. Uh, what COVID-19 has done is clearly amplified and magnified the challenges before us, as well as the opportunities for us to address these in some very meaningful ways. Uh, with regards to the incoming administration, I, I, I'm comfort to know that uh, as part of uh, their Build It Back Better plan, that they made uh, racial equity uh, in addressing disparities a key, key pillar, uh, both in terms of really thinking about what are the opportunities to close the opportunity gap with regards to uh, wealth creation uh, or the opportunity to address many of the health disparities that we see. Uh, to ensure that people can live longer, healthier uh, lives and productive lives. Uh, so from that perspective, looking at a detailed plan that the Biden Harris administration uh, crafted prior to um, the presidential uh, election results uh, last week, uh, it's very clear that the issues around equity uh, is a central focus of their strategies for bringing America together and moving us forward. I will also say that in the context of the issues around disparities, it's not just a moral argument that these are things that we should be doing because it's the right thing to do, but there's been a series of reports that also illustrate that there's an economic argument for addressing these issues. In fact, uh, according to Kellogg Foundation, they released a report that indicated that closing the racial equity gap would actually produce roughly $8 trillion additional dollars to GDP by 2050. Uh, and that with regards to additional federal taxes revenue, you would see an additional $450 billion in federal tax revenue on an annual basis. And then when you look at state and local tax revenue, states and local and localities would see an additional $100 billion in uh, additional tax revenue. So the question is really the fact that disparities we know inhibits people's ability to live longer, healthy and productive lives. So what would it look like if we were actually able to address that and close those opportunity gaps? And what the research is overwhelmingly showing is the fact that we as a society would benefit uh, tremendously. In other words, that these disparities actually hamper our economic growth. Uh, and I think that when you look at the Build It Back Better plan, uh, there are a multiple series of strategies that the Biden-Harris administration has outlined as a way to really close those opportunity gaps and really uh, I would just echo some of the points that um, Grace and Bob said earlier, that we have someone um, who's taking leadership, who understands uh, the value and looking at the interconnectivity of the American population. Uh, so I am optimistic with regards to the issues that we're seeing. The other aspect of this too is the fact that I do wanna give a lot of, uh, some acknowledgement, if you will, to what we're seeing with respect to private industry in this space. Uh, whether it's the business roundtable that has made uh, addressing equity a major pillar of their work among some of the major employers in this country. Uh, and they've come out with a series of action plans, both in terms of um, the work that needs to be done in private industry, but also some of the public policy position that they're taking. 
uh, or the work that the Chamber of Commerce is doing around um, their four pillars with regards to addressing a lot of the disparities that we see that we're also seeing at this moment in time uh, that private in industry taking on a heightened role to try to address some of these issues, both in the context of health and also in the context of wealth. Uh, in some cases, whether it's the chamber that's going into um, looking at businesses and small businesses opportunities, uh, or some of these other organizations that are looking at the role of education and the criminal justice uh, system, uh, that we're seeing pr private industry take on some leadership roles that uh, we haven't seen uh, to this extent or to this level or to this magnitude in the past. And I think that gives us some comfort. I think the question moving forward is um, whether or not uh, what we're seeing can be sustained uh, over time. And I think that uh, given the fact that we have a new administration coming on board, uh, that it is uh, it is refreshing in many ways uh, to be able to say that, that there are some possibilities to uh, accelerate some of the changes that drastically needs to happen. Thank you. And, and to your point around the the data i mean this is so critical and of course our members are so in tune with this trying to get the um the research data um to the policy makers and convince them that it's more important than you know the politics of some of these issues let me let me um go to a question in the in the chat um and um i'll get i'll send it to you bob but let's I'll let everyone um then respond and i'm going to add to this slightly, um, Bob, but the question is many advocacy, advocacy groups push to get long-term residents to vote. Do you have any data on, on turnout from long-term care residents? Any idea of long-term residents voted for Biden or Trump? Now you may not know that and I'll let everybody take a shot at that, but um, extrapolating from that question, let's put long-term care on the table um, let's put, um, you know, the potential for a Elder Justice Act reauthorization and some long-term care reform on the table. And we'll start with you, Bob, but let's just, um, Bob, Grace, and uh, Jean um, take a shot at this broader issue of long-term care and what, what it may mean for the election and next Congress. Right, okay. Thank you for that question. Um, I don't have any data uh, on the first part of the question, but I will be as anxious to find out as anyone else, and we will uh, do our best to do that. And if we find it, go to our Elder Justice Coalition website, and we'll have it up there for you. I neglected to also, in the beginning, to also say I'm thrilled to be with uh, my colleagues, uh, Gene and Grace, uh, in this session, and uh, uh, they are they are the new generation. I you know I yield to them at any point. You know uh, they are. They are what we need going forward. They've demonstrated it in many different ways. Um, you know, the long-term care, I mean, you know, being candid, I, I, it, it did not reach the level of importance that it should have on either campaign, frankly. Uh, there was probably more activity on the on the Biden side than on the, on the, on the Trump side. You know, the, the caregiver proposal in particular, getting rid of the waiting list for home community-based care and Medicaid, other proposals were good, but we're still not, at the point where we're addressing this issue the way we should. This remains, in my book, America's denial issue. We've been at it for a long time uh, on a bipartisan basis. And, you know, the, the numbers continue to, to, to uh, creep up as far as the need is concerned. And I would hope you know, that we would have an honest discussion about the need to address long-term care, long-term services and support in a new administration. And there's many avenues to pursue this. There's a Medicaid avenue, there's a tax avenue, there's a number of things you can you can do but you've got to elevate the issue. So there's a political imperative associated with it to make people want to do something. And on the Elder Justice Act, uh, as you well know, Brian, as a uh, valued colleague on the uh, whole issue, uh, we have a possibility of a one-year reauthorization of the Elder Justice Act uh, funded uh, that could be attached to um, either the emergency uh, spending bill uh, as the House did in their version, or in a continuing resolution, depending on how they go about doing it. Uh, we are committed to that, uh, but I'd also point out that Vice President Biden did endorse the reauthorization, the full reauthorization of the Elder Justice Act, as well as a number of other nursing home reform issues. So we look forward to working with them going forward past this year and see what happens. Thank you, Grace. Thanks. It's a um, it's an interesting question. I also do not have data on 
the nursing home piece. But I think one thing that's important is to really understand what's driving sort of the concerns of older adults in the nation. And I think about the way that the vote split, Brian, you, you talked about that a little bit earlier, that you've got, you don't have the down ballot um, support that we thought we would have seen, you know, so it what it's not like, you know, um, Joe Biden came in and then there was just a huge blue wave. You know, I think you're seeing people reaching out and wanting to cross the aisle. And when it when it comes to that, I think it's important to think about what are the issues that are driving older adults to vote, to engage, to look for leadership in Washington. On the caregiving side too, I think part of this that we don't talk about in long-term care is we don't imagine ourselves in those positions. And I think there's a role to play for families as they are more open, especially in light of COVID, more open about their caregiving experience to, to bring that conversation back around, particularly when it comes to home and community-based services. I think one of the things we've seen with COVID is so many people are saying to themselves, you know, is my, is my family member safe in a facility and can I bring them into the home environment? And that means really thinking differently about the way we live. I'll just share, I just moved into a new apartment and yesterday I was thinking about uh, how short I am and how these glorious tall cabinets are beautiful, but that I can't reach any of the shelves. And it just reminded me of all this movement around accessible design. You know, how do we build housing, for example, that is accessible to older people who maybe are at a fall risk and how that type of design would benefit people across a lifespan in the same way that we all benefit from curb cuts or we all benefit from other accessibility features. And it's not just that specific example, but I think having a national conversation about what does it mean to take care of each other and particularly the older people in our lives is where we need to go. And part of that is destigmatizing some of those community-based supports that would have benefit for many of us. Thank you, uh, Jean. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the long-term care issue at you, and the next question you're gonna start for us, and that relates to the importance. How important do you think it is that um, President-elect Biden name a geriatrician to the um, coronavirus task force? Evidently. Um, that may not have happened. Go ahead. Well, th thanks, Brian. Uh, so similar to uh, Bob and, and, and Grace, I don't have data on the long-term care population, particularly those in nursing homes, in terms of voting patterns. What I do know is the fact that, as I indicated earlier, that we did see a share of older voters more broadly uh, vote in this year's election relative to 2016, uh, particularly those over the age of 45. Uh, the share of older voters increased from 56% uh, to 60%. Um, but I do think it, it warrants, given everything that we know and we've seen over the last couple of months uh, and the devastating impact COVID-19 is having on nursing homes, uh, it would be great to get that type of analysis to see exactly what did that turnout look like, particularly uh, for that population. I will say this, that I think that it's critically important uh, that uh, as we start to think about how we re respond to uh, the pandemic, both in terms of the current response as well as as part of the recovery, that we have to come up with a strategy for addressing the issues that we're seeing within nursing homes as part of that broader strategy. I, in front, in front, in, you know, to be uh, fully transparent, this is not a challenge that's just facing the United States. Uh, we've seen this uh, in Europe. Uh, in fact, I think anywhere between 40 to 80 percent of all of the long, uh, all of the deaths that we've seen in COVID across the globe has uh, been linked back to older adults, particularly those in long-term care facilities. Uh, so it's fair to say that uh, that countries who are serious in terms of addressing the pandemic have to incorporate a very robust strategy uh, that addresses the devastating issues that we're seeing with respects to nursing home residents in a very meaningful way. I, I don't think you can tease those things out, that they're actually interconnected. And that's critically important. Uh, and to Bob's earlier point, I do think this is critically so key, 
uh, and I wish we had more time to talk about this, uh, but I think that this is America's uh, biggest denial. Uh, when you go back to the Claude Pepper Commission uh, in the report, uh, it, it was stunning to me to see the call to action and the Pepper Commission report relative to the call to action that was done as part of the Long-Term Care Commission report 25 years later, uh, that we really do need to figure out a way to address the issues that we're facing uh, with uh, around long-term service and supports. Uh, and I think that uh, up until we're able to do that, what you will likely see and continue to see is the expansion of um, a range of different options to meet people's uh, long-term care needs as an alternative to institutional care. Uh, I do think it's gonna be critically important to address the institutional bias uh, within particularly Medicaid, but I think the broader question is whether or not one should have to spend down their resources in order to finally get the help that they need. We know that millions of people rely on their family caregivers, uh, as Grace indicated, to provide that type of care. Uh, and um, once that, um, you know, uh, when you look at the trajectory, uh, you know, it taxes families, uh, it has implications, particularly for those who are working. Over 60% of family caregivers are working. It has implications for their own financial security, as well as the emotional toll that comes into, into play. And then we also have the challenges of uh, systems that are quite, uh, that vary, frankly, from state to state. Um, and we have a system that, um, a, a, that entitles people to nursing home care. Uh, when the vast majority of people would prefer to receive care in their homes and communities. We've done some research at AARP that shows that for every one person that you can care for in a nursing home, you can care for about two to three people in the community. Uh, so not only uh, is consumer preference and cost effectiveness aligned with regards to expanding these options, uh, it just makes good business sense. Uh, so I, I do think that there's some opportunities for us to think about how do we move forward? Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, under the Biden-Harris plan, that they have a range of different strategies for addressing the issues around uh, long-term service supports, whether that is eliminating the wait list for home and community-based services, uh, or uh, utilizing the mechanisms that they have within their disposal, which would be the, the uh, CMMI, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations, to create options that would help to expand the range of options for individuals who need long-term care as an alternative to a nursing home, uh, that we'll start to see many of those. And I think as Bob indicated before, uh, some of the challenges that we face over the last couple of years, particularly with work requirements in Medicaid and some of those other challenges uh, are, are not likely to move forward under this administration. Uh, but we do have to address the broader issues around the long-term care system. And I think the late Josh Wiener said this best, you know, uh, can we, um, subsidize uh, the need for long-term care uh, for twice a, the number of people with the same amount of money. Uh, and I think that's what it boils down to is how do we finance this type of care moving forward uh, in a way that really uh, meets the needs of a range of people. Thank you. Let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you, Bob. We haven't talked much about, you know, kind of the, the uh, the potential changes in the House and the Senate in terms of leadership or key committees related to aging and health care. Are there any any that stand out to you? Um, and um, then uh, I'll let you jump in on the uh, geriatrician question that I yeah, I threw right. out there from our pan from our um, participants as well. Right. Um, well. Well, you know, not everybody's done a complete analysis quite yet, but I think the House is a little easier uh, since we're not going to expect the change there. Um, the uh, two committees that will have change in leadership will be the, the Agriculture Committee uh, and the Appropriations Committee. And in both cases, particularly the Appropriations Committee, that decision will be made before Thanksgiving. And you have three um, qualified women running for that position um, in Rosa DeLauro, Marcy Capter, and Debbie Washington Schultz. Um, uh, I'm hopeful, personally, that it's Rosa DeLauro who gets the nod because she's done some fabulous work in running the Labor HHS subcommittee. Um, on agriculture, um, it's possible um, that Marsha Mar Fudge could be the chair, um, but Jim McGovern may decide to switch rules and go to agriculture because his work in nutrition, so we'll have to see about that. Now, the Senate, because of the uncertainty of the outcome, 
you know there'll be a change at the chairmanship of the Senate Finance Committee. Senator Grassley is leaving that position, so Senator Crapo is viewed as the uh, the next chair. If it's a Democratic, then Senator Wyden would take over. On the Agriculture Committee, there'll be a new chair there, and right now, if the Republicans keep it, it's Senator Boozman from Arkansas, and if it's Democrat, Senator Stabenow. Appropriations, um, the only change there would be if the Senate flips, and then Senator Leahy uh, would end up as chair of the Appropriations Committee. The Budget Committee, I'm not really sure. There's some possible change. Senator Sanders could end up if the Senate flips being the chairman of the Budget Committee. The Health Committee, Health Education, Labor, and Pension Committee is very interesting because uh, if it stays Republican, either Senator Burr of North Carolina or Senator Paul, Kentucky could end up be, as the chair, and that's to me like night and day, but that's another issue. And on the on the Repo Democratic side, if it should flip, it's either Senator Murray or Senator Sanders, from what I can tell. And if there's a flip, Senator Casey would take over the Senate Aging Committee. But I think the key thing to watch here is if there is a 50-50 Senate, you know, Senator uh, Vice President-elect Harris ends up waiting, it being a huge influence in the, the conduct of the Senate, and her, and her impact will be enormous if that should happen. So, you know, we'll just have to wait it out and see uh, after these elections in, um, in January. And on a leadership side, just quickly, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi is already committed to uh, running for speaker again. But I think the key for her is she needs to recommit that this is her last term. Uh, and the thing to watch is, does she get challenged anyway? And how many no votes are there or abstentions when the time comes to vote for the speaker? I personally believe there's a sacrificial lamb out there among the House Democratic leadership. I think somebody could be challenged and somebody could be take, could be defeated in that in those ranks. And on the Republican side, I think uh, Congresswoman Cheney may be challenged for her leadership role. And on the Senate side, I think everything seems to be status quo, uh, no matter when, who ends up uh, running the Senate, the leadership will stay the same. And then on the geriatrician question, yes, I, I'm, I'm, uh, that, that is unfortunate. I think that uh, might be an advocacy issue for some of us to take up. Um, this, is in, this is consistent with um, you know, some of the policies that are going on with respect to immunization that we have been critical of. Uh, advisory pit co committees that advise the Centers for Disease Control never have uh, geriatricians on there, and it's about time we started to focus on this population in the context of COVID recovery. Thank you. One quick follow-up. Um, if Rosa uh, DeLauro becomes chair of the full committee, um, do you suspect she'll be able to keep her Labor HHS chairmanship? Yeah, that might be too much an inside the Congress question for me, Brian. I don't really know. I hope so, um, but I don't have the clairvoyance to tell you that right now. Okay. Um, Grace, let's go to you. Um, if you want to say anything more about the conversation we've had so far, um, that's fine. Um, but I'm also going to throw something else at you, and that is um, Medicare for all is not going to happen. We know that. We The Democrats didn't even nominate someone who supported it. What about um, Medicare um, as an option for those who are 55 to 64? What do you think? Well, I, I'm chuckling because I feel like I'm still a believer that a not that Medicare for all could pass, but the idea of some type of a public option I think is very attractive to people. And I think the political will around that conversation is going to change in light of COVID. So if if we still continue to see economic pressures amplify, you know, essentially we have a, a marketplace in which people's health insurance, if you're of working age, is tied to your employer. So as more Americans become unemployed or they shift to gig type work, whether it's being an Uber or Lyft driver or independent consultants, you know, that impacts like your availability to to get health care, particularly, you know, in moments of crisis such as what we're facing now. So I think it's possible for it to come back. And I actually think part of this is sort of reinforcing and reinvigorating the Affordable Care Act. I'm not sure that everyone who's outside of the beltway um, and people who are not nerds you know and i and i say that lovingly i think of myself as a policy nerd um 
I, I don't know that they're following ACA so closely. So, you know, I've seen people in response to the election say, well, my healthcare situation has gotten better. And they're not necessarily tying that back to the Affordable Care Act because it's taken such a long time to implement so many of those provisions. You know, they're reacting to the current presidential administration and so on and so forth. So I think that there's a real possibility to bring that back. I do think there's probably a piece of that that's wrapped into the long-term care conversation. But I also, I'm, I'm hopeful that the fact that we're all experiencing this major healthcare event will point people to the direction of this is not a luxury, but something that we really need to have. And I'm hoping that the the attitudes have changed a bit um, over the last five years, but I guess we'll see. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, well, um, it's a um, what you're articulating sounds to me like um, this. There will continue to be a push from part of the Democratic Party for more. Um, much more than just the 55 to 64. Gene and Bob, do you want to chime in on on that? A very important issue for um, older adults, depending on how you define older adults, but also for um, so many uh, individuals across the country that end up losing their jobs at that difficult time. Um, it, it age period of their life um, and need to, to make sure they have health coverage. Gene? Sure, uh, Brian, a, a couple of uh, observations. I think one of the observations, uh, particularly around um, COVID-19, when we saw the significant number of people who lost their jobs, and in addition to losing their jobs, they lost their health insurance, um, uh, which was extremely devastating. Um, I think that when you look at, uh, at least prior to the presidential election and uh, looking at some of the polling to the extent to one still has faith in uh, polling, um, what you saw was a huge gulf uh, of variance between Trump and Biden supporters, particularly uh, as it relates to healthcare. Uh, in, in fact, I think that um, looking at some of the data prior to the uh, presidential election, 82% uh, of Biden voters or those who are leaning Biden indicated that healthcare was very important to their vote in the 2020 presidential, presidential election. That's in comparison to 44% of Trump, lean Trump voters. Uh, and I think that kind of is telling in part, going back to the earlier conversation we had around the division, around uh, some of these issues, uh, particularly around the larger population of voters. I do think that uh, as Grace indicated uh, in her uh, response, uh, that tomorrow is a very important day. Uh, tomorrow is the day that uh, the Supreme Court will take up the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and I think that is it, this warrants attention uh, and clearly warrants uh, broader conversations in terms of exactly what do we need to do to ensure that people have access to high quality and affordable health care? Uh, and how do we ensure that um, individuals are able to receive that level of care um, in a way that meets their needs and where they are? A um, couple of things um, on the Medicare for all thing, you know, I, I think it's, I was thinking of when I read the, the obituary of Dr. Phil Lee uh, and how he was so involved in the Medicare creation and focusing on social justice within the Medicare program, uh, his voice is, would be so important to have now as we debate the future of Medicare. Um, and, you know, Medicare for all was more of a political thing than a policy thing. Uh, I think it's obvious based on how it was reacted to by different folks. But I think the concept of Medicare for more um, could find its way into uh, policy going forward, the question what what age do you lower to? And um, I think that could be a robust discussion in the next uh, next Congress. And on the Affordable Care Act, yeah, Gene, you're right. I mean, they're going to have the debate, uh, the arguments tomorrow. Uh, there's a great analysis actually in the New York Times this morning, which I saw, um, that talked about you know how the different ways you could rule on this whole thing uh, with the Affordable Care Act. And I think you know whether if you knock out the individual mandate, uh, can that just be severed from every, and let the rest of the act uh, hold up? 
Um, but the consequences, if you repeal the entire uh, Affordable Care Act, would be hugely devastating, particularly at this point in time uh, with the pandemic going on. And I would also add, as, as, as my colleagues know, uh, there were huge improvements to Medicare made as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Most notably, the fact that you have this whole new range of preventative coverage that you never had before with no copay that was built into the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so, you know, let us let us hope for, um, you know, the best possible outcome going forward. Um, but I think that article today is interesting, particularly the comments made by the new justice um, in some uh, earlier comments that I think are somewhat revealing about where things could end up. Yes, yeah. Actually, actually yes, some some uh, somewhat optimistic uh, uh, thoughts I had when I heard those. Um, let me let me go to you, Grace, and just say um, I'm wondering if um, you have um, a little more to say about what the pandemic has meant for caregivers and the workforce. Um, and if you have some ideas about how policymakers need to address um, what has happened as a result of um, these last eight months, which have really turned um, caring for people on its head. Well, one thing that we've seen is a couple of core pressure points. We've been talking with researchers and advocates and other stakeholders to develop a framework to describe what the impact of COVID-19 is on the caregiving journey. And the couple of things that have emerged, we've touched on a little bit in this conversation. You know, Jean talked about, for example, um, nursing homes and nursing facilities and trying to make decisions about that. I think access to internet is something that's emerged as being a huge issue for caregivers, particularly having access, not just in rural areas, but also other you know, urban, suburban areas where they, you may not have access to high speed internet or the type of internet you would need to be able to work remotely or to participate in a telehealth visit. The other is intergenerational families. You know, the demographics of the United States are changing. I think we see a lot of that in the election results and, and groups are trying to figure out sort of how do I fit into an America that is aging and that is more colorful and diverse than it's ever been before, but also where you have people sort of clustered in cities versus more um, rural areas. And I, I think what that translates to is you have intergenerational households where the person who's doing the care work might be coming in and out of the house or they might be an essential worker. And so the challenges that they're facing in COVID things like keeping the home safe from contagion um, are a little bit different than, you know, the person that can work from home but has no break from caregiving or is not able to access respite. And so those are some of the tensions we're seeing. You know, the other thing I would just say for caregivers, there's a little bit of an upside in that in the same way that we're all looking at each other on Zoom, for those of us who can telework, you know, someone might say, oh, I've got to take the dog out or I've got to answer the door. And I think what's nice is caregiving is becoming more normalized, right? Like, oh, pardon me, I just have to step aside and give my dad his medication. And I think that type of visibility is really good, but I'd like to see Congress move forward on for example, the HEROES Act and some of those provisions around COVID-19 that recognizes older Americans and the people who care for them need workplace protection and not just if they have COVID, but if they're impacted by COVID and they can no longer do the things they normally would do. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna throw this one at you first, Bob, and then see if Jean, um, who works for the 900 pound gorilla in the room has a comment. Um, is it possible that uh, the Biden administration in some sort of a bipartisan way would would uh, tackle Social Security um, in the next Congress? I mean, we saw that this president talked about his interest in actually ending payroll taxes, <laughs> which wouldn't um, bode well for the Social Security system. I'm just wondering, is this something that we, we've got a Democrat in the White House? Is this something we should try and deal with now? Um, 
Good question. I, I've been thinking about this too because, um, again, you know, it stayed as a relatively quiet issue uh, during a campaign, except for the decision to suspend the payroll tax. But I think the, the the issue that we need to focus on is the impact of the pandemic and the unemployment rate um, and the ability of people to contribute to the system um, being um, will likely lead to a moving up of the date of, do, of date of doom that the trustees will come forward with this year. And I think when that happens, usually when there's sort of a movement in the wrong direction about when, when Social Security could reach the point where it does not pay full benefits, that can motivate action. But as we all know from working in this field for too long, if you did a word association game and I said to you the word Congress, the next word out of your mouth would not be foresight. And so that's been the situation with Social Security for years. And you know, both you and I, I know me for sure, I was around in 1983 and when the last time they had to make a huge reform in Social Security, but that was when the trustees came and the actuary came to Congress and said, you've got to put some more revenue into the system or it's going to not be able to pay benefits. We shouldn't have to do that. I would hope that the president elect Biden might follow the Reagan principle on this one, which is to create the bipartisan commission, you know, with the right people at the table, with the different ideas at the table, let them emerge with something and have the president, you know, have their back when they do produce something and then end up with something hopefully constructive. I hope, I hope that step is taken by the new president elect. That's great. We're running low on time, Gene. Could you um, give us a short answer on that? And then I'm going to turn it over um, to Trish, who's going to talk um, a little bit about um, GSA, and then we'll wrap it up. Well, thanks, uh, Brian. I, I think Bob uh, said it extremely well. Uh, I, I think the current decisions that we're seeing coming out of the Biden-Harris uh, team here with regards to one of their first priorities was to announce their task force to address COVID is a clear signal to me uh, that this is their top uh, priority. And as Bob indicated, clearly to the extent to which we can respond to and address this pandemic and also reduce the unemployment numbers that bodes well for many of the programs that rely on these revenue sources uh, for solvency purposes. Thank you. I should give I should uh, give you a quick chance to to respond. Do you have any Social Security thoughts, um, Grace? Um, well, you know, there's a joke I think among millennials that there's an assumption that Social Security is not going to be there for us, anyways, um, which is not a very funny joke. But um, I raise that because I think part of making of continuing to protect social security is to have people who are caring for someone as well as anyone who's aging to recognize that it's not a foregone conclusion. We can all um, play a part of it, but I do think it like so many other sort of wonky healthcare and aging related issues, it can be difficult to get your hands around it. And so it would be great to see some champions emerge that can talk about it in a really simple, powerful way um, and get people galvanized to really invest in more infrastructure for um, for older adults and for caregivers. Oh, that's that's great. I appreciate that, uh, that addition to the conversation. And with that, I'm going to Thank uh, Trish D'Antonio for making this uh, all happen for us today. And Trish, take it away. Thanks, Brian. Um, first, I just want to thank um, our panel members, including Brian. Um, your work in the aging field and advancing aging policy is so important. And I feel truly honored to get to work with you um, on these issues and call you colleagues. Um, for our members who are listening, you know, GSA's policy work emphasizes bridging research findings and scientific findings to policymakers and um, to inform policy decisions at the federal level. So as you think about the impact of your research, um, I, I, I hope that you're thinking about, and we invite you to consider about the, the impact of policy, the policy impact of your research. Um, and reach out to your members of Congress, reach out to um, your lo state and local officials as you are disseminating your research. Um, if you are ever invited to testify uh, or if you are in the Washington DC area to um, disseminate your policy research, please contact us because um, we're happy to support you um, in that endeavor. 
Um, Judy, if you go to the next slide, you know, we're active in many coalitions in DC to share and promote your research that can impact us all as we age. Um, so please continue to read our policy column and our policy actions in Gerontology News to stay up to date. And we look forward to um, continuing to promote your research as um, we work with the new administration and the new Congress. Um, if you, um, as this come, as we come to a close, we're going to send you an evaluation. Judy, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, you will receive a webinar evaluation. We appreciate your thoughts. Um, for those of you, we didn't get a chance to get to your questions. We'll try to get a response to you um, sometime after the, the webinar. We hope to have this up um, posted on our website uh, within uh, 48 hours. Uh, so keep, a, keep an eye out on the GSA website for this uh, webinar. So with that, I would thank our colleagues again and I would say that this brings us to a close.